Hello everyone, I'm Anurj Nakare and you're watching Night Talk. Uh, one Nation, One Election seems to be all that's covered in today's news cycle and we wanted to understand how this could be achieved. Our managing editor, Mr. Manu Sebastian, also spoke to the former Chief Election Commissioner, Mr. S.Y. Qureshi, on this issue as well. But in this interview, we're focusing a lot more on what kind of constitutional amendments will be required to make this possible and what kind of concerns it could pose, if at all they're necessary, specifically on the democratic fabric of the country. Gautam Bhatia is a constitutional law scholar, lawyer, and science, science fiction aficionado. He, he's also, his well-known works include The Transformative Constitution and Offend, Shock, or Disturb. His newest release is called Unsealed Covers, which chronicles the actions of the judiciary over the last decade and its relationship with the state. He also runs a popular blog on constitutional law called Indian Constitutional Law and Philosophy. Mr. Bhatia, welcome to Live Law. Thank you. Uh, the country is currently abuzz with the speculation over one nation, one election. But before we discuss why and why not, let's talk about the how. Uh, would the current scheme allow the government to pass a law of introducing simultaneous elections even without constitutional amendments? Well, you'd need the constitutional amendments of a pretty wide ranging variety because there are two conflicting principles that are um, at stake. One is that the constitution presently in formal terms uh, prescribes parliamentary democracy and one of the fundamental features of parliamentary democracy as you know is both there in the constitution article 83 implied in article 83 and has been held by the supreme court is that um, the uh, government lasts as long as it enjoys the confidence of of the house and if the confidence is lost uh, then you know the house the government falls, the house is dissolved, and there are fresh elections. And so that's one principle. And the other principle is fixed and unchangeable terms, which is the underlying basis of uh, the proposal for simultaneous elections. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring the constitution in line with, with fixed terms. Uh, and that must be set down in the constitution for that to, to go ahead under a law that then sets out the modalities of it. Okay, so let's unpack that uh, one bit by one bit. Uh, our current understanding is that to usher in a system of simultaneous elections, like you said, either some state legislatures would have to be cut short or they would have to be extended. The constitution talks about an upper limit of five years for the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies, but there's no mention of a lower limit. Article 83 and 172 say that they will continue for a maximum duration of five years, sooner dissolved. Let's talk about dissolution of a legislature. Under the constitution, what are the ways in which a duly elected state legislature can be dissolved or the union for that matter? Yeah, so one, of course, one method is uh, that uh, the uh, the government itself you know, resigns and uh, invites the, uh, the executive head to, to dissolve uh, the, the house or the parliament as the case may be. So that is voluntary and that is the prerogative that is present with any any uh, any government under a, again under a parliamentary uh, democratic form uh, that uh, that liberty or that leave to say okay I, I no longer enjoy the confidence of the house or then I no longer have the the ability to govern uh, is with, uh, with is with the government and then the logical consequence is uh, dissolution after you know trying to find attempts you know we can make attempts to find other ways to keep the government running if there are no such avenues available, then the dissolution follows. So, and so one way is to do it voluntarily. If you can get all the present um, state governments whose term stretches beyond whatever date you want to start the simultaneous process, and if they voluntarily resign and dissolution follows, then that is one way to go about it. That, of course, will lead to other problems, which we'll get into later in, in this conversation. Uh, the other method, if there are governments who do not want to uh, dissolve themselves is to impose Article 356, uh, and then uh, and then as has been held in the Rajasthan case, followed by Bomai, uh, something like dissolution can be done uh, after the 356 proclamation has been approved by both houses of parliament. Uh, the problem with that is that the fundamental uh, purpose of 356 is restorative. So you, the idea behind it is that the government in a particular state uh, cannot be carried on in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. Uh, and therefore, you need to suspend and potentially dissolve the government and bring things back to a point where that can happen. Now, of course, uh, forcefully dissolving the government under 356 because you want to synchronize 
the timings of a general election and state elections is not a restorative purpose. Uh, the only way it can be, in which it can become a restorative purpose is if you first, uh, you know, introduce constitutional amendments that make simultaneous elections like a, a mandate or a requirement. And then, you know, again, this is all potential. I mean, it, it still seems to me outside the scope of 356. But the only possible justification then can be that in accordance, uh, in an attempt to bring all these governments in line with the constitutional requirement of simultaneous elections, we have to dissolve uh, X or Y state government. So, so again, but for that, you will first have to then bring about fairly wide scale um, alterations in uh, the constitution that would effectively signal a shift from uh, parliamentary form to uh, a fixed term form, which is something closer to a presidential type of system. Like it's not obviously equivalent, uh, but it does. It is a departure, a marked departure from uh, you know core principles of parliamentary democracy, where there is no guarantee that a government will last its full term. Okay, that's. Uh, that's one great thing to know that it was my next question was about article 356 and uh, how it would be imposed if it can be imposed uh, to curtail the terms of the state legislature. So we'll move on to the next part of the discussion for just a bit. And we can probably circle back to that if I have any more follow up questions. Uh, but the first one is what are the constitutional amendments required to introduce this change in, in order to pass these amendments Would the ratification of one half of the state would be required in terms of the proviso of Article 368.2. Uh, so, of course, you answered a part of it. If there's more and you want to expand on uh, the constitutional amendments themselves, that you're welcome to. But would state ratification be required for some of these amendments or any of these uh, amendments? Yeah, so that is one of the questions that has been put to the uh, committee that's been constituted. Uh, where the, the question is that is ratification required in terms of Article 368 Clause 2? Uh, so clearly, government believes that there are at least two reasonable views there. Uh, one that it is required and one that it's not. Um, in my view, it is very clearly required because uh, you are directly touching upon um, an aspect that is uh, within the state's domain, which is state elections. So mm -hmm. state laws to in a situation like that is fairly clear that uh, a constitutional amendment that will uh, effectively determine or in certain ways place constraints upon the conduct of state elections uh, would need to be ratified by uh, the state legislatures in accordance with the state clause too. Okay. Um, just quickly, I also want to ask if there's any provisions of the representation of the People Act that would need to be amended by uh, any chance? I know at first blush, but there may be some that, you know, depending upon the shape or form that the amendments take, you may need to, but uh, I don't think anything sweeping is required in the in in the in the statute at least, uh, because that's more to do with the specific uh, conduct of elections and not the broader um, you know uh, broad, uh, issues around the elections. But again, I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, it may once the amendments actually we, we, we can see what they are, uh, we'll be in a better position to know if there need to be consequential alterations in the statute as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also uh, something I. I just want to ask you about because uh, when we read about, we were researching about this, this is about the previous question. Is the, when we looked at the state and the union list about elections, it said that while elections are in the state list, they are subject to parliamentary laws. And even the 19, uh, 2018 draft report uh, of the law commission that we read seems to suggest that uh, ratification might not be necessary because this is a subject that's, that's uh, well, the state is subject to the parliament's laws. That is not uh, a correct argument. The fact that the, that the lists say that um, because the lists are only fields, uh, they don't, they're not power conferring. The lists only say that uh, this is the field in which X or Y can legislate, uh, whether it's list one, list two, or list three, and that insofar as uh, states legislate on elections, a union law that deals with elections shall have supremacy over a state law. So that mm -hmm. is quite different from whether a constitutional amendment requires uh, state ratification. That is taken care of under Article 68 Clause 2, the terms of 68 Clause 2. And you can't mm -hmm. use the language of the lists to uh, to interpret 68 Clause 2. That's, uh, that's basically using a, effectively a uh, an entry or provision of the constitution that deals with field of legislation 
to interpret a higher law making power which is uh, 368 laws to so that according to me is not a correct argument okay um let, let's just move on for now let let's let's say the government manages to amend the relevant provisions of the constitution there are some practical concerns about this like how will like you mentioned earlier in this interview how will be the five year cycle ma- maintained we had simultaneous elections till 1967 which has come up in several interviews and copies that we've read during the uh, during the research for this uh, for this particular interview and video when the synchronization fell off after midterm polls uh, had to be conducted so what happens when the synchronization falls off again will we need to have this exercise of synchronizing synchronizing elections again by cutting short some terms and extending others every 20 to 30 maybe even 10 years is that uh, because that doesn't seem like an enduring solution yeah so first of all you know when the example is cited of the first 17 years uh, what's important to note is that the situation is quite different now in the sense that in the in the initial years of the republic um, you uh, effectively had it was more or less a one party dominated um, country where you know there was barring a few exceptions the congress party in the center and in the states as well and so uh, what we have now which is a multiplicity of, of political parties and often states and the union being at loggerheads wasn't so much an issue at the time uh, and that's why for a while this worked smoothly uh, that situation has radically altered now so i don't think that the precedent of uh, you know the initial years is a particularly good one to say okay you know because we had it back then uh, that shows that you know it's it's a good thing or it's workable or whatever so i think that's something to just bear in mind that the the political landscape um, uh, and obviously the constitution interacts with politics uh, has changed quite a bit now on the on the question of, of what happens when uh, a state government or for that matter the central government loses its majority or loses confidence of the house and falls uh, midway through its term that brings us back to my initial point which is that there is an underlying contradiction between the underlying premise of parliamentary democracy which we are formally committed to in the constitution and fixed term uh, fixed terms the underlying basis is that you know uh, you can't have that uh, a mid term government falling or collapsing right? so of course one is that you want sweeping constitutional changes that in a certain sense take us away from from uh, you know the, the premises of parliamentary democracy but assuming that this is just an amendment and you want to still keep the structure intact uh, that leads to the following issue as you said what happens if in the middle of the term a government fails collapses loses confidence if the you know finance act is is voted against all of that so there there are two possibilities that arise uh, one is that uh, uh, you uh, effectively impose president's rule and that continues on until the next cycle so if say government in karnataka for example falls two and a half years into its tenure uh, you basically impose president's rule center rules for the next two and a half years that's one answer the other answer is that you have an election in that state and uh, but that but with the with the knowledge and the understanding that whichever government comes into power will only uh, last until the next cycle so if the government falls in two and a half years then the term of the next government will be two and a half years now both these solutions have uh, their own problems the first solution is it takes a wrecking ball to federalism right so you effectively have central rule imposed on a state for you know uh, a certain time period it also leads to perverse incentives where it is then actually in the center's direct interest to destabilize uh, state governments because the consequence of it will be effectively central rule so it is as a matter of principle a problem for democracy and federalism and on the practical level given the way politics is structured uh, it will only give further incentives to whatever is the ruling party to destabilize state government something that's been part of a you know discourse from the very beginning the other mm-hmm. answer which is that you have a two and a half year long or two year long term has its own problem so one is that if the major basis of this uh, proposal is cost saving then that gets you right back to extra elections extra costs second is that uh, again the whole idea the other idea is that you have this because then you have one round of elections and then for the next 5 years you can as as the government or the opposition 
you don't have to waste time in campaigning you can focus on the work of governance or holding to account the government of your opposition that again then goes because then you are again in mid term political campaigning and so on uh, and also if if government is voted in in say in the fourth year it has one year before the next cycle there's going to be no governance for obvious reasons the, the government will then look to doing whatever it can in that one year to perpetuate its you know its rule after the next cycle so again you you are undermining the very basis for the, the proposal in the first place so both these answers come with their own set of of problems which again and just to reiterate this point there is as i said a fundamental contradiction between uh, parliamentary democracy and fixed terms so and as long as you try and do say small scale amendments uh, where you have a parliamentary democracy in the functioning but fixed terms at the same time uh, you will have these contradictions and tensions just coming in all throughout so either you have a radical overhaul or you keep the way the way we are right now it can't be a minor surgery because then that will bring parts of the constitution at war with other parts of the constitution okay so uh, i know you talked about it at length already i just want to expand on that for just a minute the remainder of the period concept the one that we just discussed as as one of the two possibilities yeah. uh, a big argument is that this concept is not foreign to the indian constitution or our statutory frameworks like by elections or municipality elections which whenever there's a vacant seat there's an election to fill, fill it for the remainder of the period uh and of course it, it can be applied here is what we were hypothesizing then would it be possible for the five year cycle to be maintained by conducting mid term polls following the dissolution of the lok sabha or no, state assembly the fundamental distinction between a seat falling vacant and having election for a seat and having election for having elections for the house right? so the so the seat falling vacant is an exceptional situation which which arises when somebody passes away or or someone resigns or something of that kind it's not something that's contemplated within the normal uh, uh working of of democracy it's an exceptional situation to take in to take it into account and to not have non representation uh you bring uh, you know by election in whereas here what you're saying as i said part of the design of parliamentary democracy is that governments fall in the middle of their tenures and there is no guarantee of a fixed term so that mm-hmm. is not a box a feature of parliamentary democracy and that's what effectively you're short circuiting through through this so that's the distinction lies one is an exceptional case where you need to uh, have a by election to fill a vacancy the other is when in the normal workings of of parliamentary democracy a government falls uh, you then uh, you know uh, artificially sort of shorten its tenure the next one that comes and that's the distinction in in the two situations okay uh, so the law commission in 2018 draft report recommended that in the law commission uh, report that i previously uh, referred recommended that in order to ensure stability of governments and its consti- uh, con- continuity the german concept of constructive vote of no confidence needs to be adopted this has been talked about widely in the media as well the, the commission also recommended that the option of limiting the number of the times a no confidence motion in one lok sabha or assembly term may be explored what are your thoughts on this will this negatively impact our democratic setup yeah so that again as i said uh, what's happening here is that you uh, are making a change which is simultaneous elections that's sort of the main change you want to bring in um, and that is as i said there is tension there between that and uh, parliamentary democracy and then uh, when you find that there are problems your answer is to then start changing other aspects of uh, sort of the core features of democracy so that you can continue on with your plan of uh, simultaneous elections or the proposal right so the ability of the opposition to um, to raise a vote of no confidence is something that is fundamental to this form of democracy that we have adopted right so the idea is that the the government lasts as long as uh, it has the confidence of the house then when it loses that it has to go right uh, now there can be a larger debate right over whether we want a parliamentary system or whether we want to shift to a different kind of system like a presidential system for example right there has been that that debate that's happened a few times in our history uh, but that's not the debate we're having right now right so that is not the present debate uh, and that requires a much deeper much more wide ranging 
a much more nuanced discussion uh, because uh, that would have a major shift. And also, if you are shifting from this to a presidential system, then uh, what you have to keep in mind is that in other such systems, there are lots of checks and balances uh, that are there in the constitution to prevent the abuse of power by the executive. Right? So the US system has multiple veto points. We don't have that because the parliamentary system has its own inbuilt checks and balances. Your opposition, uh, form of, or since the speaker, although the situation the speaker is obviously not you know, neutral uh, by design, and other such inbuilt checks and balances. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, if you're going to move from one to the other, what checks and balances you have to introduce to ensure that there is no abuse of power and so on. Uh, what is the worst of both worlds is to first start with the premise that you want simultaneous elections. And then each time you have a problem coming up, as is the problem of midterm or you know beginning term or late term government falling, you try to address that by introducing another requirement that is alien to the system, like no confidence votes. And then you have the worst of both worlds. You'll have, you know, an executive that is effectively insulated from, you know, uh, the house even more than it is right now with the anti-direction law and so on. Uh, so as I said, uh, this is not something that you can do by first saying, okay, I want this one change, simultaneous elections, and then having little tweaks here and there to, uh, you know, to, to have it through. You then need to really fundamentally rethink the fundamentals of the constitution uh, and systems of governance before you can make that change. It's all connected. It's not just that you can do one change and then expect that everything else will fall into place because that won't happen. Okay, Let, then let's move on to the why and why not. Uh, the proponents of holding simultaneous elections argue that not only will it save huge amounts of public money and the time of the government officials, but it will also liberate the country from the perpetual election mode. The, of course, the concerns here are that saying that this is a threat to our federal structure and it might completely sideline regional political parties and issues. Many have said that public expenditure uh, is an irrelevant consideration when federalism is at stake. What are your thoughts on that? You, you've touched upon it previously a little bit. Is there a merit to the reasons cited to simultaneous elections? Do you think the pros outweigh the cons in, in this case? Yeah, so I think it's uh, so there are two or three different things in your question that we should tackle separately. So first okay. is the cost, right? So one is that from what I can gather, the cost is uh, not massive. The cost saving isn't massive, and compared to you know broader budget and so on, so it's not that it'll be some prohibitive uh, or some huge savings that you know um, can justify this massive change. I don't think cost in itself is a good enough argument, and. Um, Again, if you have to then have midterm elections or, you know, synchronize later on, ultimately, you know, it will come out to uh, the costs, uh, you know, coming back up as well. So, so I think that we, I mean, the costs aren't a good enough argument in, in this in this case. The uh, the perpetual campaign mode is an interesting point. And I think that, that the reason why it's interesting is because if you think about it a little deeply, there is no reason why the national uh, executive, uh, cabinet, the prime minister, or for that matter, the national opposition, the leader of opposition or the national figures should be spending their time campaigning in state elections. Right? Nobody is forcing them to, to campaign. Uh, and if state elections are meant to be fought on uh, state issues, there's no reason why the state political unit uh, should not be effectively doing the campaigning. Uh, you know, And if you look at, again, the US, right? So it's not that uh, Biden will go around having multiple campaigns for every you know state level election you may go and make one speech you know in a once in a couple of months or three or four months uh, maybe endorse you know a candidate and so on but you wouldn't see him you know hitting the campaign trail uh, for state elections all the time it's just an, I mean, of course the us is a very different situation i'm not saying you draw parallels but just this idea that there is a national domain and the uh, national politicians are engaged in governance at the national level and their um, intervention in state level election campaigns is meant to be limited is actually a com pretty common sense point of view. Uh, it's just something of a pathology that in Indian elections now, uh, every uh, election at every level sees the participation of uh, national level figures. So I think that it's a, a bit of a self-serving argument, right? So uh, national level politicians 
it's their choice to come and you know take time away from governance or opposition and come and spend their time uh, campaigning in various states they don't have to do that right and then they want to bring in uh, simultaneous elections to solve the problem that they themselves have effectively created and so i think that that's not particularly a, a good solution in that sense because if otherwise you look at it um, if uh, so you'll have the one national election and then you have multiple state elections which are like state elections and so in that state uh, you would have two elections every five years so it's not that in in a particular state there needs to be a permanent campaign mode and there's no need why a national level politician should be in a permanent campaign mode just because an election is happening somewhere in the country which doesn't concern him or her and his or her task of governance so i think that that's for me the um, the camp permanent campaign mode argument is a self serving argument uh and therefore again not a good enough reason to uh to have this this shift unless you can show a, a principle uh, reason why there needs to be the shift uh, i don't see a good enough reason for it uh, as far as federalism goes uh, so that's again i mean that's more a pathological issue than an issue that is embedded in the constitution uh, but you're right in that uh, when you know there is extensive involvement of national level politicians in Uh, these election campaigns there is a blurring between the issues involved right and and that tends to uh, then uh, make us lose something of the federal uh, you know uh, domain because ultimately then there is always a battle uh, between which kinds of issues should predominate in the state election uh, and the uh, and and if you then have uh, simultaneous elections there is an even greater risk that the uh, concerns the federal concerns the concerns that are there with respect to areas that the federal unit is competent to to resolve will tend to get lost uh, in uh, in the election campaign now again uh, this is something that is not necessary to uh, that it happens uh, and we have seen in the past uh, in states like odisha for example there is a fairly big difference in the vote shares of the parties uh, even when you have elections on the same day you know that uh, you have say the bjp winning at the national level and the bjd winning at the state level so voters clearly uh, you know are intelligent enough to mentally distinguish between voting for a national party and a state party even at even in a simultaneous election so i think i wouldn't want to make too much of this argument but there is a risk for sure there is a risk that that you would further weaken uh, the federal domain by by uh, by encouraging the blurring of issues in you know an uh, election that is simultaneous i do want to get into uh, the weakening of the fe- federal system a little bit later but before that i have another uh, another question that flows through here and before i ask that question i need to like ask a descriptive question as a, uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a student i want to understand what the model code of conduct is and where it finds itself in this scheme uh, like in the grand scheme of this discussion and then i'll go to the next question the model code of conduct is is basically imposed by the election commission and uh, it kicks in to play at certain time before an election uh, a date of an election and the idea is that for example uh, the the ruling the incumbent who has a benefit by virtue of controlling the resources of the state uh, should not effectively be in a position to bribe voters right so you know by suddenly spending state resources uh by suddenly creating projects which it hasn't done last four four and a half years um you use state resources to do that just before the election so that the most recent memory the voters have is of x or y right so in order to ensure that there is something of a level playing field and to mitigate the incumbent's advantage among other things you know of course the model code of conduct also has various other restrictions on you know kind of speech you can things like that so there's all there's all of that as well but the the core idea is to uh, have a level playing field in the run up to an election okay so now i can move on to the next question sort of after we have this context is that niti ayog did an analysis which shows that assuming the average period of operation of the model code of conduct as 2 months for an election to be a state assembly it would be reasonable to expect the mcc to apply for about 4 months or more every year in the same region of the country or other the argument here is that during the period of the mo- uh, model code of conduct is applicable everything other than the routine activities come to a standstill 
This includes the development programs, welfare schemes, and other things that have an effect on well-being of citizens. What is your opinion on that argument? So I haven't understood the argument because if you're looking at one particular state, that state will have a national election once in five years, and it will have a state election once in five years. So uh, under present situation, so the model code of conduct will be applicable only when the election is happening in that state vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that state. So in that sense, it will only be for say two months before the state election and then the national election. So unless I'm missing something here, I don't see what the argument is because it's not that uh, every time you have a state election, uh, the model code of conduct applies to the whole of the country. As far as I know, I mean, I, unless I've completely misread uh, the provision. So in that sense, uh, it's not that uh, under the present regime, you have like the model code being imposed across the country four months a year. Right? So, so that I don't think is going to make a big difference. Okay. Um, then let me put you uh, to the widespread concerns about simultaneous elections challenging the fabric of federalism, which is the basic feature of constitution. You mentioned this, we've gone over this slightly before. What is your take on it? If the government introduces this scheme, do you think it would survive a constitutional challenge? Do you think simultaneous elections will pass the muster of basic structure doctrine? And what can you tell us about that? I mean, so look, the, I, mean, I understand what you're saying. The, the argument that is against the, the, the scheme or the program uh, is that um, the uh, the what will happen is that in a simultaneous election, the issues will be blurred. National issues will take predominance over state issues. And what that will mean is it will benefit national parties over regional or state parties. And it will... Uh, it, it risks creating a one-party state where, you know, if, say, the the central government is, you know, uh, pre generally preferred by voters for X or Y reason, that preference then will bleed into their state election choices and there'll be a greater likelihood of, of you know, having the same party in power across states and center, which will then lead to a, you know, so a certain kind of uh, concentration of power. Right? So, is, so that is, as I understand it, the broad federal argument, right? Um, I think, first of all, uh, that is not a basic structure challenge. Right? So, because effectively, this is a political argument that this is like what will happen or what is likely to happen if this goes ahead. Uh, it does not, that does not mean a violation of a, of a constitutional uh, feature, basic feature. Right? Uh, so because that again, and again, this, there's a lot of assumptions over here. How will voters, you know, uh, respond? Is the fear genuine? You know, will will the voters not be able to distinguish between, uh, you know, the state issue and the national issue? So there are all these uh, there are all these uh, assumptions there that are more close to common sense or just instinct, and assumptions you can't actually prove in practice until you've had this, you know, a few times at least. So until you demonstrate that, it's really uh, hard to see how a basic structure challenge uh, can uh, can go through. So I don't think that there is something that. Uh, that in in this proposal uh, that is uh, that violates the basic structure, I think it needs to follow the correct procedure um, for for amendment if that amendment is to take place, which is I think uh, as I said, uh, C68 clause two. And I think the bigger issue is not uh, basic structure, but in so far as you are bringing this in via the constitution, as we discussed a little while earlier, you then have to make all kinds of other changes to ensure that. You know this model of elections is consistent with the overall structure of governance. So as I said, parliamentary democracy and fixed term elections are hard to reconcile. The UK they tried that and then they found it wasn't working, right? Uh, in in the last decade. So so you need to actually then very carefully ask yourself what other constitutional changes you need to make to have a sort of coherent uh, system where the election mechanism is consistent with the governance mechanism. I think that's the bigger challenge and not a substantive uh, uh, basic structure challenge. And so I, I agree with you that there is a risk to the federal scheme. I don't think that risk is demonstrated enough to sustain a constitutional challenge. Okay. Is there any constitutional challenge besides federalism? Is there any other aspect of basic feature? Do you think this might affect? No, like I said, so, I mean, so look, uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, the Supreme Court has said that uh, democracy is part of the basic structure. It has not said that parliamentary democracy is the only uh, 
conception of democracy that the constitution requires us to commit to so if at some point there is a desire and the requisite numbers to uh, shift from a parliamentary democracy to a different kind of of democracy one that is more consistent with fixed terms then uh, i don't see it as a basic structural violation because the constitution requires that there be democracy right and there be federalism as long as those uh, features are maintained what specific form it takes uh, presidential parliamentary hybrid that is not something the constitution you know is prescribing so i think that substantively it's not a basic structural issue as long as the amendments you bring in are not inconsistent with to the core tenets of democracy uh, they will pass muster uh, so in that sense as i said the bigger challenge is how do you bring these uh, in line and in, and make them consistent i think there's the, the real problem uh, because mm-hmm. to do that you need to as i said it actually a very fundamental departure from the present constitutional regime and that requires a kind of deliberation and discussion that is not limited to just elections but goes much beyond that okay um there's one more argument from the draft report uh, of the 2018 draft report that i have to unfortunately bring up uh is that there are some studies indicating that voter turnout might improve if there's only one election for both lok sabha and state assemblies but at the same time like we've discussed there is a danger that there are concerns that regional issues and parties would get sidelined and elections will be fought and one on the issues of national prominence we briefly talked about that you even gave the example of orissa uh, but what do you think of these arguments by themselves i mean which one do you find uh, more compelling uh, voter turnout is not a ground for constitutional alterations uh, if you have a problem with voter turnout then you you know you can you can make it you can make voting compulsory as in uh, the australian case or you take your steps of you know like national holiday provide transport i mean there are many things that the election commission can do to to uh, increase voter turnout but again yeah, if you're not making elections uh, compulsory if not making voting compulsory as limitly as you are respecting the people's choice to uh, to vote or not to vote as as they may desire so in that sense uh, constitutional alterations shouldn't be based on on some studies showing that okay next system more people vote in next y system fewer people vote because again the number of variables are immense there right? so so i think we need a stronger footing or a firmer footing on which we are uh, contemplating structural constitutional changes this is too weak a footing to say okay you know on this basis we will make this fundamental shift um, you know shift away from the fundamental tenets of of this system of democracy we will you know uh, have a system where effectively uh, you know you're having zombie governments just to fulfill terms so there are all these problems right so and you need to Uh, they need to be as i said strong principle reasons why you want to you know uh, create those problems to justify uh, the the proposal not some something as uh, you know contingent as as turn out okay i just have a clarification to ask of and because uh, i'm not entirely sure what it means zombie governments just to complete terms so, so, so for example you say that okay you know uh, government has lost confidence but so one uh, proposal which is not not discussed yet is that you just keep it in power as a minority government and it just does you know uh, it passes a few bills it can get support on and and you know basically it's a lame duck government until the next election uh, so that is one thing that could happen right again again that's a pretty severe democratic cost over there right so you have a, a government that doesn't enjoy the support of the house uh, but it, it can't be dissolved because then you have to have you know your fixed terms and so it just limps along uh as a minority government that has lost legitimacy so that is one thing that might happen uh, and that is again as i said the democratic harm there is, is quite severe um so you don't want that to happen either okay um one last question i have is how do you think the sorry for the repetition again but how do you think the voting pattern will be affected is there a way to tell the first 17 years is not a good enough standard because the political predominance of that congress enjoyed but should this be investigated further because there's a study we came across uh, by NUJS which says that like you said uh, the um 
party, the regional parties could really benefit from this, like we discussed Odisha before. Yeah. So is is there an uh, argument to be made there? So I, I don't think the argument should apply either way. I mean, as I said, it, it, the reasons for this fundamental shift have to be structural. Uh, sorry, have to be principal reasons, right? Um, I, I think that that to the extent that you see some overwhelming change, you know. So, for example, if you see that um, voter behavior is such that regional parties will be completely wiped out, you know, if this happens, and we will effectively just have national parties. And if that is something that's testable and empirically demonstrated, uh, then yes, then that is that reaches a point where you say, okay, you know, the damage to the federal structure will be such that you that's an argument against it. But if you see, like, you know, if the studies show that there might be marginal, you know, increase either way, I think that then that you know is no longer a reason either way for or against uh, against the move. Uh, then it just shows that it is within a certain range. Uh, and then you have to look to other reasons why you should or should not go ahead with um, with with this proposal. Okay, so that that is part of my question. Should this be investigated before we irreversibly change? It's relevant information. It's relevant information, and it, it's worth a closer look. And it's obviously one of the factors. Um, but I think that from again anecdotal understanding. Um, the impact is not so massive uh, that, um, you know, as I said, it could become a standalone reason either way. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I agree that, of course, it's relevant and should be investigated further. Um, uh, uh, and as, as part of this discussion around this, this proposal, because again, you don't know what will be turned up until you investigate. And then you see, you know, uh, because again, I mean, it, every state has its own unique political uh, trajectory and what is happening in Odisha might not actually hold for other states. It might be in certain states, uh, there is a much, much greater blurring of national and state issues. It could be in other states. Um, you you do have then the complete sort of subordination of the federal issue to the national issue. And then, of course, you want to know that as part of the decision-making process. I think, yeah, you should investigate it further. So I don't know what it will yield uh, tangibly. Okay, that that's all the questions I had. If there's more information you'd like to volunteer about the concept, would love to hear it right about now. Well, I think that that one other point to make is that um, I think that a lot of the assumptions underlying uh, you know this um, this move is the assumption. I think not, and these are not assumptions coming from the government, but I think assumptions coming from you know um, say broadly the upper middle class, so to say, is that there is something bad about election campaigns um, and something uh, bad about political parties. And we should try and minimize the time spent on election campaigns um, and focus on you know, the actual work of governance. So, you know, that's the sort of, I think, underlying assumption behind this. I think that needs to be interrogated a bit more because if you look at the the constitution, it begins with the words with people, and then the people disappear completely from the constitution. So there is there are no avenues of public participation in the affairs of the constitution, in lawmaking, in administration, uh, beyond elections. And if you look at many of the more recent constitutions, uh, you see that there are these constitutions carve out a space for the people to engage. With, with lawmakers, with lawmaking, with constitutional change, even outside the election cycles. So, you know, you have the right to recall, as you have in some U.S. states. Um, you have referendums on certain issues, as you have in some U.S. states. You have a constitutional guarantee of public participation in lawmaking. So a bill must be uh, subjected to public participation mandatorily, as in the Kenyan constitution, the South African constitution, right? So all these constitutions provide space for people to meaningfully engage with public, uh, you know, uh, acts of, of lawmaking and legal change, and and you know the, the politicians on a recurring and regular basis. Which the idea being that uh, democracy is a, a continuing uh, system of accountability, not a one-time, uh, once a five, once in five-year system, right? Now our constitution, because it was framed, you know, quite a while back doesn't have those mechanisms that sort of evolve a little later. Um, 
and in that context elections are pretty much the only uh, time when the constitution gives a formal uh, um, uh, mechanism avenue of participation by the people and in that sense we should i think uh, uh, work towards deepening uh, that and in, and in that case uh, you know more frequent elections more frequent campaigns uh, uh, more frequent engagement uh, with uh, between the voter and uh, and the politicians and understanding in fact and this sort of is the reverse uh, the reverse side of the coin from the federal coin is that you know sometimes it could be the case that um, the uh, the voter uh, uses a state election that comes midway through uh, national uh, parties dominance in the center to actually among other things uh, express dissatisfaction with the direction that the party at the center is taking right so it can happen it has happened and and so you know any all these elections are very complex in that sense right so in a state election there will be state issues but also if uh, if the political party at the center has become very unpopular you know in that time period uh, uh, an expression of that could be how a voter votes in a state election Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's an that could be an essential corrective. Could be an essential check, telling the political party, look, I mean, you know, what you're doing is not good. So correct yourself before we, you know, punish you again in the national election. Right. So I mean, so in that sense, uh, we need to look at elections not just as waste of time and waste of money, but in our constitutional framework as one of the very few avenues where the people can actually make their voice heard uh, in a through a formal channel. And if you look at it that way, I think that. Uh, there's nothing then wrong with uh, a calendar, a political calendar in which elections are frequent. Right? So I think they they ensure that you keep uh, politicians on their toes, especially national level politicians who you know have to face elections in multiple states, and you ensure that that conversation is ongoing and it never really stops. So I think if you look at it that way, um, some of the instinctive sort of support for the one nation one election proposal. Uh, might then require to be rethought a little bit. So I think that's the additional point I'd like to add. Okay, that's um, all we have. Uh, thank you for everyone who's watching. And uh, if you like the content that we make here, please leave a like and tell us in the comments what you think about this issue. Also, please consider joining our channel and supporting the work we do here by joining our channel as a member for only rupees 89 per month. Thank you.